Welcome to Leaders Recon, where we will be discussing leadership, warrior skills, and other unique opportunities within the G3 Leader Development Branch. I'm your host, Joshua Carr, and today we're going to be discussing the role of the Warrant Officer and what they bring to the fight with the 7th Command Chief Warrant Officer of the Army National Guard, Command Chief Warrant Officer Teresa Delmeyer. Ma'am, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. So, you're from the Midwest, I hear, and, and I grew up in the Midwest in Missouri same type of things. I heard that you kind of enjoy working on the farm, doing a little bit of horse riding and stuff. How has that experience been coming over here from the Midwest? It's a little different. I, I think coming from the Midwest, because when you can drive, when they say it's 70 miles, it takes 70 minutes to get there. Exactly. Here, when it's 10 miles, it takes 70 or longer to get there. And I was amazed by the mm -hmm. traffic here. I mean, I've been through big cities and everything yeah. driving, but it is very different. No, it's the same with me. I grew up an hour from work, which was 60 miles away, and I came here six miles away in Alexandria and it still takes me an hour to get home. So it's, so I understand that. Um, from what I understand, you have kind of a unique story of what made you join the military initially. So when I Graduated from high school. I had a full ride scholarship to play softball and volleyball for a local college. And uh, so I got all ready to go. I'd been dating someone for a good seven months, eight months. And when I went to the school, he got a little upset after a couple of weeks and says, you know, you're just too far away. And crazy things that people do when they're in love. I quit college and went home, and then a couple weeks later we broke up anyway. So it was a terrible decision. But I, uh, after that, I kind of went to Lincoln to see my brother, and my brother had his reserve uniform on because he was in the Army Reserve. And he was a, I think he was an E7. Okay. And didn't think nothing of it, you know, okay, military uniform. But then my friend uh, was going to go see a Marine recruiter. And she's like, hey, you want to go with me? And I'm like, yeah, I'm not doing nothing anyway. I'll, I'll go with you. And then they tried to recruit me. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to join the Marines, you know. And, and so I had an Army recruiter next door. And he goes, hey, you want to come talk to me? And so I went over and talked to him. And I wasn't impressed there. So I go back to my brother. And I'm like, yeah, I'm... Yeah, that's I'm not going to go regular army, you know, and and people would laugh going, oh, you're going to go to Fort Living Room, you know, after you get done with yeah. basic training and everything. Anyway, after I did that, um, I started doing some research and somehow um, I was looking up the National Guard and huh. a couple of my classmates had gone um, their junior years. So I'd kind of seen them. Okay. And so I went and found a female recruiter, Master Sergeant Sharon Hilt, and she was the most honest recruiter that I had talked to the entire time. I talked to, you know, the Marine and the other Army. She told me everything. And coming from the farm life, I am very physically fit anyway. So, you know, work is nothing to me and and doing physical fit stuff was natural hay bales yeah and yeah and so i actually uh it was my first plane ride was flying to basic training oh wow yeah because i i just didn't go very far from you know i was born in omaha but then i was raised in Soresco, which was 15 miles from lincoln and uh, as there was a furniture store there that said 15 money saving miles from Lincoln because it was always the best deal to get. But anyway, they always, um, you know, the farm life was just, hmm. you know, hard work, yeah. but it, it taught you, you know, to prioritize, you know, and being physically fit was one of the things for me. So after I went to basic training, um, I went to 71 Lima School, which is uh, 42, okay. you know, a unit administrator. And then right from basic training, I went to the other side of the hill at Fort Jackson to my AIT. I was there for five months. And I left on my brother Rusty's birthday, and he said it was the best birthday present he could get. <laughs> but I actually came home on my mom's birthday, 
And uh, so that was the best birthday present she could get. Well, there you go. And um, so then I came back to the unit. I was in um, Stark headquarters. You're probably too young to remember what Stark yeah. headquarters is, but it's it's the old Joint Force headquarters. So Stark headquarters was our headquarters for the state. Oh, they're in Nebraska, right? right. Yeah. Well, for any state, everybody had a Stark. Okay. Yeah, and but now everybody has a Joint Force headquarters, and. Um, so I started working in there, and and then I had a supply sergeant that I liked working with too. And he mm -hmm. says, "You want to come learn supply?" I'm like, sure. So I joined the 67th Infantry Brigade, and I went over there, and and they go, "Well, we want you in the commo section." And so I did OJT, mm -hmm. which she can't do now, but I did OJT and got a 72 Echo which was a radio operator, a radio wire operator. And so I did that. So on drill weekend, we laid wire so we could call each other on comms and um, picked it up after the drill weekend. And so did that. Mm -hmm. And then I actually, uh, the 76 Yankee was who I worked for. And I was like, I want that MLS. And so I, we had manuals. And I ordered those, and I got that MOS. And that was all within four years. Wow. So you've done a lot of different things then over the course of your career. Because you were a tech for some time, right? So I, I got back from basic training um, August of 83, and November of 84, I became a technician. A subsistence POL clerk. So I tracked all the food service and all the fuel consumption in the state um, in that position. So I was a, I was a temporary tech too as a GS4. You, know, you don't hear that anymore because you can't keep people in positions for GS7s. Oh, wow. I mean, it's, it's hard to keep young, young soldiers to want to stay in there. They all want to be AGR. Mm -hmm. And so I, I did that and I had a CW4 that was a traditional food service advisor and he actually um, was who I worked for. And, um, but he was great. He was a great mentor. My boss, my first boss was a W-2, CW-2, Mr. Weber. And um, so that's, it's always important to find mentors. And sometimes they don't come to you. Yeah. You have to find someone that you're impressed with and you go to them and, and, you know, start talking to them. And that's how you end up getting the mentors. Well, obviously, you've come a long way now, ma'am, as a CCWO, I guess. So, like, me, when I came in as a young officer, I had several people come to me and they're like, you know, warrant officers are the technical experts um, for the military. You know, go find one and let them advise you on these things, right? And so could you kind of highlight for us, like, you know, what is the role of a warrant officer today? So did you come in right from ROTC? Yeah, right. For me, it was, I got, I had a four-year scholarship. I just commissioned direct, right out of ROTC and then went into the guard. So I had an active duty commission and I was like, no, I want to do some stuff on the civilian life and then tipped into the guard formation. So, so. usually the warrant officers, they will have six years background, you know, some kind of experience. Now the aviator's a little different. You could go to aviation um, as a, you can go to candidate school as a E4. Okay. But you still have that enlisted background. Yeah. And, and so, and I hear this a lot from the O grades, you know, the, the, even the two three-star generals, they say they, are happy that they had some enlisted time so they understood what the enlisted soldiers are going through and when even when I was going to go to Warren officer school they said never forget where you came from and so the Warren officers are the technical experts but they got to have that enlisted experience mm -hmm. too and then they build on that yeah so I know there's a I can remember my first experience working closely with the warrant officer, right? It was always like almost a mystical thing at times. Like, I, th I think he had a little note on his desk that was like, I do what I want, <laughs> quote, you know. So could you kind of highlight for those that are not as, uh, not as familiar with like, hey, what are those things that those warrant officers do, that combat multiplier, you know? Um, I know they have a wealth of experience, right? A lot of times serving in positions, 
you know, longer than your command team will. So as an example, take supply for instance. What is it that a supply warrant officer does that really differentiates it between what maybe that supply sergeant does or that NCO working with them and that officer that might be the OIC for that section or something? So I'm going to I'm going to take an example when you're doing a um, SRP when units are getting ready to deploy. Okay. So the the warrant officer is is the one that's doing the accountability and and checking if they have all their stuff and if they don't the supply sergeant has to order the stuff through the warrant officer to to get the stock or items for somebody. And so once you ensure that, you know, the supply sergeant will order the stuff and the warrant officer makes sure, oh, are they authorized that? To, you know, and they'll make sure that that unit is authorized to get the item. And then the commander, and, and this is where it's crazy because the supply sergeant will do a hundred percent inventory. And if something is missing, then he's either, they have to do an investigation, you know, depending on what it is, mm -hmm. he's got to report it to the commander. Well, the commander either has to pay for it or charge someone for that item, but the commander is overall responsible for everybody, you know, in the unit. So all the trucks, everything is issued to that commander. Yeah. He's signed for everything. And then the supply sergeant will will hand receipt it to people. Okay, so there's supply sergeants in every unit, but the warrant officers are the ones that accountability for the entire state. And then the O grades, the officer for that unit, is signed for all of his equipment. Plus responsible down. for training right. and everything else. So that warrant's like really specialized in on focusing on on supply stuff for those units under that headquarters. Yep. You brought up a point about this just a few just a minute ago about um the specializations. Um and how, you know, in the Guard especially, we use those civilian skills a lot of times in our in those military roles. And there's been a trend over the past few years to do direct commissions for certain specializations, whether it's, you know, attorneys or doctors or other specialties, especially in the cyber fields now. Mm -hmm. Do you see that happening in the warrant officer field as well to kind of keep their, you know, pay commensurate with um, those specialties? I, I do. Um, cyber is one of them. Uh, the cyber and signal and because they're civilian acquired skills mm -hmm. and as the command chief for Nebraska I did recruit a cyber uh, college student and uh, he went to basic training and he was going to go right to candidate school we had it was kind of a test and so I think it's going to happen more and more um, even in the active component mm -hmm. and I think it's important because these these kids are you know they they want to serve yeah but you know as well as I do on the signal community and the cyber you make so much more on the outside but if they want to serve in the uniform that is the great way to do it on the weekend yeah that's what I was kind of wondering about that since since the warrant officer specializing in you know a specific field kind of like you talked about if that was something you thought we'd kind of go towards with uh with those very specialized fields mm -hmm. it's like do we really need this like specialized cyber skill right do we really need them to go be a commander somewhere or do we just need them to to uh, be the technical expert exactly and so that's why I was kind of getting that you yeah. you also touched on something here a little bit that I wanted to ask you about and that's was the role of those relationships you mentioned the colonel said you can be my warrant officer anytime you know um being in those positions for a lot longer i know we talked about the rotation sometimes for the command teams how do you balance that uh, relationship both from the warrant officer's perspective you know advising a commander and you know best practices you've seen from commanders in their relationship with you as a warrant officer so it all starts with respect and, you know, the enlisted 
I respect that E1 mm -hmm. all the way up to the four-star general, and the respect goes both ways. And if you show that they are part of a team and you bring them in, I, I think that's important for anybody that's in the unit. But with the warrant officer, we have town halls and workshops, and we tell warrant officers, when you're going to a new duty assignment or you know, somewhere to talk to your commander, you need to tell them what you can do for them. Not, not being cocky, you're just wanting to let them know, here's what I can do for you. Here's what my job is. Here's what our section does. And if the warrant officers do that, that relation, you start building the relationship right away. Yeah. And, and telling the truth, sometimes it hurts to hear the truth, but the warrant officers will be honest, but they'll keep you out of trouble too. And I've always, um, I had a W1 that went to a new unit and she was having a hard time with the full-time staff because yeah. she was truly a traditional uh, warrant officer, but she worked full-time in the Joint Force Headquarters. Okay. But she was in a traditional for this unit, and uh, so she got one of the second lieutenants, they were, they were kind of being treated poorly. And uh, so she took them and she's like, Hey, you know, let's let's go have some mentorship. So she she actually mentored these lieutenants hmm. and developed that strong relationship right at the beginning. And I and I tell my warrant officers, you need to do that. Don't those days with the you know the stained coffee mug and a cigarette in one hand and walking around like you know everything and that you don't want anybody to touch you those days are over because you need to know but you need to communicate you need to talk to your commanders and it's important that the warrant officers you know deliver their message on how valuable their technical yeah, skills are that authenticity almost yeah. yep so speaking of that what advice do you have for warrant officers at all levels for being able to make that impactive and effective change um, as a combat multiplier within their organization? I would tell the warrant officers that they need to get out from, from behind that desk and they need to go and talk to the commanders, talk to the enlisted, because it's important don't ever forget where you're from. Mm -hmm. Go talk to those enlisted because they have great ideas. No matter if they're just joining the unit or if they've been around for 15 years, everybody has valuable ideas yeah. and you need to take those in. But you'll see a lot of warrant officers. Um, the person that took my place in Nebraska, he actually, I had to hold him back because we would go out to see the maintenance bays mm -hmm. when we'd go to annual trainings and visit um, the warrant officers and their soldiers, he, I turn around and he's over there working on a, a vehicle and I'm like, you can't do that. And he's like, oh, but it's fun. It's fun. I was like, but the soldiers see that they absolutely love that mm -hmm. because the warrant officer is right there getting their hands dirty with you. And, and that's important. So with that, like plethora of experience, you know, with different managing all sorts of different relationships like that between yourself as a warrant and command teams or NCOs, what are, you know, can you give us some specific examples maybe of like a great relationship you had with a commander and then maybe one where you have lessons learned? Um, a commander, when I went to Iraq, um, we had a Fulberg colonel and when he got upset and I'd never seen him get upset, but I did and seen him start yelling at all of his lieutenant colonels and as a leader, you learn early, you praise in public, and you do your discipline behind doors because it is not, it's very embarrassing to the individual mm. that's being yelled at in front of everybody. And so this colonel yelled at the entire unit in Iraq and, and nobody wanted to follow him. Even other entities that were on that base with us. So, the person that glued everything together 
was uh, Colonel Byron Diamond, which he was, he was a lieutenant colonel at the time. But he was running over half the unit and everybody had a deep mm. respect for him. So he actually was the glue between the colonel and all the other uh, officers and enlisted that had to deal with yeah. the colonel. So, I mean, you deal with it and again, you have to respect them and, and you try and you understand that. I had a colonel um, when I became the command chief for, for Nebraska. He told me, Chief, not everybody's going to love you. And I was like, really? <laughs> it's, it's like, why? And he yeah. said, there's people that want your job. And I was like, okay, fine. But, and I think that was good advice mm -hmm. because not everybody's going to see it the way you do, but that's okay. You know, and like I would you say that's one of your bigger lessons learned as far as like managing relationships, managing relationships. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I come from a big family and uh, and I was raised four brothers prior to me and one right after me. So I, I had to be tough. Is it all boys but you? No. Oh, OK, was, I was going to say. No, um, I come from a family of 10, five boys and five girls. At least, you, at least so, you had an even mix then. That's right. That's right. But I was born after four boys, and then the fifth boy <laughs> came. So I had to be tough. Yeah. You know, because everything was thrown at me. I had to play, play football with my brothers, you know, and be ready to do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, you're a person there to do the job. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter, you know, if you're male or female, as long as you can do the job and do the job well. Yeah. So I, I think that's important. Speaking of that, you're talking about in the world right now, we have we have the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and a lot of training schedules changes or, or rotations changing, those type of things. As a CCWO, you know, what's, you know, what has been your like big focus or what keeps you up at night, you know, with dealing with like the big changes that have occurred over the last couple months? So training, mm -hmm. the warrant officer pipeline, and it slowed down completely. Uh, they did uh, Fort Rucker. I, I deal with the active component all the time and we were trying to figure out what we could do. I think one of the biggest challenge was that uh, Fort McClellan, we have two phase sites, um, phase two sites, which is Fort McClellan okay. and uh, Camp Atterbury, Indiana that do phase two for WOCS. And then we have all the other states, we have 27 states that do phase one now. And so we all feed into the two phase two sites. Well, McClellan was supposed to start in April. And so they said, nope, we can't do it. So the active component says, you know, you can't travel. And so we had to, we had to postpone the April course in McClellan. And at the same time, we've been working with Compo 3, which was the Army Reserves, mm -hmm. to do an accelerated WOCS for the RTI. Okay. So we were supposed to do that at McClellan. So all of that was put on hold. Yeah. And so dealing with Compo 3 and Compo 1, because Fort Rucker has to approve everything. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the skills of trying to um, work with the active component. So it goes back to those balancing relationships yep. you were talking about? And keeping strong relationships. I, I'll, I'll tell you, General McConville bringing back the senior warrant officer advisor, uh, Eulandria Dixon Carter is amazing. And she is Compa One and an awesome person for me to go, go to. And I, her and I feed, you know, off of each other and, and Mr. Griffin is with Compo 3. So we've built that relationship and kept those relationships strong. And I, I think that's very important. So I, I really, I think communication is the biggest thing. So McClellan is finally gonna happen. Uh, we have 75 reserve students coming for WOCS. Oh wow. And, um, that starts on the 6th of July. 
and then uh, we graduate on the 1st of August. And, and then it's an accelerated course because we're going to run it straight through the weekends. Mm -hmm. And uh, at first, you know, the active component is like, why are you doing that? I said, because the guard works weekends, yeah. you know, and this is a way to get it through fast. So they used to have that at Fort Rucker. They used to have an accelerated course, but they stopped. So, and they used to have a seven week course for E4, but now they only do five week courses and uh, which, which is fine. But doing this accelerated course, this is history. It's never been done and in the art at the RTI phase wow. in the Army National Guard. So I think this is great. It's all Army National Guard um, instructors uh -huh. and TAC officers. So it's, I'm pretty excited. I, hopefully, yeah, it sounds like kind of an, a big accomplishment there. Yeah, and uh, Mr. Griffin, the reserve uh, command chief, he's actually going to go do a news liner after the whole thing's over. And uh, him and I are both going to try and visit the schoolhouse before they graduate. Oh, wow. So that kind of brings me to the question I had about um, dealing with these virtual trainings, right? We have virtual drill. We have a lot of virtual training going on with the warrant officers having like real specialized skills on different things. Like what's your advice to warrants across the formation and units as well regarding like maintaining some of those, uh, some of those, you know, perishable skill skills yeah. when you're in this kind of virtual IDT? I don't think it's that difficult for okay. because uh, we always have manuals to read too and we and we have the internet and I'll tell you the biggest thing that the warrant officers have figured out for many years mm -hmm. it's networking we have the best networking ever and it's it's good but we learn to network across state line in the state, yeah. Um, as the command chief in Nebraska, I um, I had my first town hall with my warrant officers, and I call everybody in, and and I come in, and all the aviators are up in one corner. I'm like, what are you guys doing? And my technical warrants are over here, and so then I said, hey, if you know the person next to you get up and if you're aviation I want technical aviation technical aviation mm -hmm. so I made them do a drill and find out what each other's technical skill was you know and the aviators yeah they fly but they could fly you know two three aircrafts yeah. if, if they want to but it's pretty amazing because they fly in the guard we fly on Tuesdays, you know, different Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights in goggles. And some of the warrants didn't realize that they could go and get on the list and fly with them. Mm. And, and so it's pretty fun to do that. But I made them introduce each other um, and telling what their technical skills were. That's networking. Yeah. And, and they, they understand it more because the 42s, if we didn't have our 420 warrant officers to manage all of our personnel records mm -hmm. and I perm everything, we'd be in trouble. So that's important, very important. But same thing with signal. If it wasn't for a signal officer, warrant officer, when I went out to the field during annual training, they have the VSATs. Hmm. And so you could have internet and make phone calls and you know it's just amazing what you can do when you're out in the field it's just like you're in the office yeah it's definitely a lot of really cool things i uh i just got a text i think it was last night from a warrant officer who's back flying again you know uh, uh, after some of the restrictions you know he yeah. was back up and he sent me a little video flying uh i just thought that was a you know, it's just, it's just, it's a lot, a lot of stuff that I feel like the warrants do is just really very cool. Like it's very, you know, unique uh, skill sets. So I've converted warrant or officers to warrant officers, just so you know that. Okay. Yeah. So when I was over in Guam, I, I had this lieutenant come up to me and he's like, you know, I, I've realized I don't want to be a commander. I want to be a technical person. And so I gave him all the tools to convert to warrant officer. 
And then later I found out he was Compa 1. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> and so I was thinking I was going to get a, a signal warrant for Guam. <laughs> and he was one of the active duty well, hey. officers. But, you know, it's important. And I, I think, and I say it to my warrant officers all the time, tell your story. Mm -hmm. Tell your story on why. I, I thought I was going to stay in the guard for six years. Mm -hmm. And I truly just thought, you know, I'll try it. And after less than two years, I fell in love with wearing the uniform. Truly was proud to wear the uniform. I may have joined because somebody told me I couldn't do it. And, you know, that's what the boyfriend says. You don't need to join the Army. And, yeah, I don't need you. So, you know, I joined it because I said, yeah. nobody's going to tell me what to do. And But I truly didn't think I would be in 37 years later. Yes, you, you've had quite an impressive career so far. What's the, what would be a resource that you would recommend to, you know, young warrant officers or, or anyone really that's, you know, coming up in the formation that's wanting to, you know, do leader development, wanting to develop themselves in some way? What's a, what's a good resource that you've always gone to? Well, more so the officers and, but a resource, it's the networking. And yeah. if you want to find out, you know, what that person does, the warrant officer, mm -hmm. you got to go talk to them. And, and it's all about networking. It, it truly is. And I believe if an enlisted person is upset with how, you know, something is not working right or, you know, they've gone to the field, if they want to make change, then become a warrant officer, you know. And the warrant officer is, and they all always, always talk about it, it's about this wide, but technically, we're this yeah. deep. And, you know, and with the O grades, they got to be this knowledge and this deep, which is fine because you got a lot of things that you got to manage. Mm -hmm. But with the warrant officer, yeah, with, they've got to know their technical skills. Always get out there and improve your skills because I became a certified sanitation instructor. Um, I taught classes all the time. Yeah. I taught classes for at PEC a couple times on food service, um, management of records. Mm -hmm. I changed regulations at Fort Lee. I, I actually was on a team that we discussed what the guard needed. And I truly love doing that. I mean, it was... Yeah. Like making change, real making change. change, but making it better for the future, which that's what I want to do here. My goal was I'm going to leave this position better than what I found it. And, and I think that's what everybody needs to, needs to do. But it's important to get your 20 years. You know, I, it truly is. I, I had, because I tell everybody everyone's a recruiter and they, they need to tell their story but they need to get that 20 years. I, I talk to E4s and say, why do you stay in? Mm -hmm. why, why are you staying in? And they said, ma'am, and they're tr truly traditional soldiers. And they said, because I can pay for insurance for my entire family for, I think it was $107 or some, whatever it was, for them to cover him and his wife and three children. He goes, I will stay in the guard just to cover my family. So the traditional ones, which is important because technicians right now, because we're GS employees, we don't get that benefit. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and that's where, you know, I think General Hokinson is trying to focus on also because if we can give our technicians the benefit of TRICARE and the benefit to obtain a bonus, I think we can keep more in. Yeah. Because you know what? Those technicians can say, hey, I can go up the road, especially a maintenance guy. I can go work for Ford and make twice the money and have my weekends off. Yeah, I mean, it's a challenge across the whole formation right now. But it's, it's important. I talked to a doctor um, a week ago. He, uh, he called me about a procedure, and, and I said, how long have you been at Bethesda? And he goes, well, I've been here like, I think, two or three years. I said, oh, you're just a 
you know, you're a doctor there? Are you in the military? And he goes, I was in the army for 13 years. Hmm. I said, oh, again, everybody's a recruiter. So I said, well, why don't you get into the Maryland or DC or Virginia guard and do seven more years? He is, well, you know, I thought about that. I said, well, think hard. I said, because you threw away 13 active duty years if you're not going to go and do seven years in the guard. I said, you need, sir, to look at that just because he left at 13 years as a major. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a good point you bring up because I, so like I'm applying for law schools right now, right? And a lot of people ask me, like, are you, are you looking, trying to be a JAG in the military? And my answer's always been, yeah, absolutely not. Um, but I do plan to stay in the guard the whole time. I'm like, regardless whether full time or not, like I want to stay in the guard um, and do that service piece. And, and you know, that that's just important to me, right? So, so you're a J or you want to go to law school. So next time you're in Nebraska, I'm going to introduce you to a retired Lieutenant Colonel that is one of the highest paid lawyers around that lives in Lincoln, Nebraska. Oh, look at that. So if you had one piece of advice then to give to young soldiers, um, warrants across the formation, what would that what would that be? You always got to set goals and they have to be, you know, close goals and and then you have to have a couple years out. And then once you meet those goals, don't stop. You know, figure out something else that's going to improve your skill. Mm. You know, always Always do something to better yourself. But, and it's, we practice this a lot, that you need to act like the entire world is watching you and do the right thing at the right time, even when nobody is watching. Because I'm gonna tell you, everybody's watching you, especially when you're the warrant officer and the command chief of the Army National Guard. But people, you know, watch you. they look up to you too. And they look up to you as, you know, as their platoon leader. Yeah. It, you just don't realize how much of an influence you have on people as a warrant officer, as an officer, or a senior NCO. Because yeah. the, the senior NCOs are very important to our formations. They are the backbone of our Army. And that's why you never forget where you come from. Well, thank you so much, ma'am, for coming on today and sharing some of your experiences with us. Tune in to Leaders Recon over the next few weeks as we bring in today's leaders and pioneers to discuss their experiences, share their wisdom, and help you grow as a leader. We will also be announcing opportunities for you to sharpen your skills and expand your toolbox as a member in today's Army National Guard. See you next time. If you would like more information on any of the topics discussed today, please visit our social media pages in the links below. If you like this episode of Leaders Recon, Please subscribe below and leave us a five-star review. You can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcast.